Archbishop Dr. Dominique Bierman has traveled the world for over three decades, proclaiming the gospel made in Zion to the nations. She exposes the false doctrines of replacement theology and preaches restoration to the Jewish roots. Now join Archbishop Dominica in the latest Bible School on Wheels, exploring the entire land of Israel. We are now with the Mediterranean Sea over there in front of you, and it is the gate of Israel. I mean, you can see this area is very strategic. Understand that seas and oceans are always very strategic for a nation. There are places of entrance. On one side, you can bring in the merchandise. So on another side, enemies can come in also. And so during the time of the Crusaders, for example, the enemies did come from the sea and they left from the sea. The Crusaders coming from Europe with the utmost of replacement theology that you can imagine and built fortresses, uh, but they came through the sea. So the area of Haifa, the area of Akko in the north, all those areas were also crusader fortresses. Now, this uh, Mediterranean Sea was also called in the Bible the Sea of the Philistines. Why? Because the Philistines lived by that sea. Where especially did they live by that sea? Normally more in the south, in the area of Gaza. Have you heard about the Gaza Strip? Have you heard about the conflict with the Gaza Strip? The ancient principalities of the Philistines are still operating in that area. It is also very interesting to note that the very name Palestinian or Palestine comes from the word Philistine or Philistine. And so when you understand the Palestinian conflict, for example, you understand it's a Philistinian conflict. We are not dealing, our battle is not against flesh and blood, though sometimes we have to fight it down on earth, right? Sometimes we need armies. I mean, when Israel was established in 1948, we didn't want to fight. In fact, what we wanted to do all the way was to conquer the land through agriculture. That's what we wanted to do. And we actually have done it because this land was a desolation. Everything you're seeing, the beauty, the greenery and all of these things, it's nothing but a mirage. It's a miracle because the people of Israel came and worked hard to turn desert, swamps, rockeries, sand dunes into a garden of Eden because it has bloomed under the hands of the Jewish people because it is given to the Jewish people as an inheritance and always you will see that a land blooms when the sons are the ones caring for that land. And by the way, that, that will apply also to your own lives. When you are tilling your own garden, I'm not only talking about your physical garden in your house, which is very nice, I love gardens, but I'm not only talking about that, but when you till your own garden, meaning your own calling, and you're working within the garden appointed for you, that means your own calling, amen? You're gonna see that when you put all of your care and sacrifice into that garden, into that calling, you're gonna see that it begins to bloom. Sometimes you will have to overcome snakes and worms and all kinds of things, rocks and difficulties. And nevertheless, when you keep on going at that garden, keep on working at the calling that Yahweh has given unto you, hallelujah, you're gonna see at one point or another that the rockeries are gonna give in. You're gonna see that the sand dunes are gonna give in. You're gonna see that the swamps with all the mosquitoes and the malarias, they're gonna give in. And that's what happened in Israel. They began to give in and then the land began to bloom under the hands of the Israelis and the Jewish people where uh, for nearly 2,000 years it wasn't so. Throughout all the different conquests, the, 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 different, the Ottoman conquest for 400 years left the land completely desolate. There were no trees here. Why? Because they taxed the trees. Anybody that had a tree needed to pay a tax. People didn't want to pay tax so they cut down the trees. And so really when the Jewish people come to this land, they don't find what we would call in good American English, a piece of cake. They found a piece of challenge. That's what they found, a difficult, very difficult challenge. In fact, the first alias, the first alias meaning the first immigrations of Jews to the land, by the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, the first and the second alias, they had to go literally physically into the swamps and dry them. And I'm gonna tell you something that 80% of them died 
from malaria. They lay down their lives. Well, why am I saying that when you're tilling your garden, when you're tilling your calling, you may have to lay down your life? In fact, if you're not going to lay down your life, you better quit. And I'm not talking, as I said yesterday, we started the, the entire tour telling you that uh, we're not tourists. Told you that we are an army that's been made right now globally, and therefore you can see people from, uh, I don't know how many nations, uh, Pastor Cyrilla mentioned yesterday, uh, did you mention? 12. 12 nations. Okay, 12 nations that are inside of one tour. And by the name 12 in the Bible is the name for government authority, amen? And so we, we are dealing here with a global community of people belonging to different nations that are becoming an army, that have become an army, a messianic, apostolic, prophetic, revolutionary army to reclaim back that gospel made in Zion and restore ourselves back to the original Jewish roots of the faith grafted into the olive tree with Israel. But what I'm saying is that when we are dealing with our garden, which our garden is the messianic apostolic prophetic movement, you are going to have all kinds of difficulties like the Israelis have had to conquer this land. Now, among the difficulties, we've had to deal with the Philistine strongholds of the land. Again, our battle is not against flesh and blood, uh, but against powers and against principalities of evil. Yes. However, sometimes we have to fight the battle physically. Yesterday I began to show you how important it is that we connect the spiritual with the natural. You see, in replacement theology, there's been a divorce between the spiritual and the natural. Kind of like we have an abstract spiritual faith in the zone, zone there, but no works down here on earth. But that is not the way the original faith goes. In fact, we can see in the book of Yaakov, Hmm? What's the book of Yaakov? James. <laughs> Very good for you. James, because King James wanted to eternalize his name in the book, but really it's Yaakov, the brother of Yeshua, that was the leader of the congregation in Jerusalem, and he said, faith without works is dead. Can you say it with me? Faith without works is dead. And what's going to happen is that in order to conquer the land of Israel, we needed works in this place. It wasn't enough to just have the faith. And there were people of faith and there were even Christian Zionists that accompanied the movement of the restoration of Israel that stood in faith, in prayer, together with many of the Zionist Israelis, Zionist Jews that began to conquer this land. But remember that the conquest wasn't from people only. It was also from the elements of nature. It was also from rockeries, from sand dunes, from swamps. We're not dealing only about people, we're also dealing about a very rough terrain. We are having a wonderful tour here and traveling in an air-conditioned bus, and we're going throughout Israel and seeing the beautiful places you just started today, but you're going to see it, and at the end of the day, you're going to tell me, wow, it's amazing what Elohim has done through His people Israel in this place. You, you're going to tell me that. But remember, it wasn't so. It wasn't so. We had to conquer, we had to work hard, we had to put our blood and our tears and our sweat in making this happen. And I'm going to tell you something. Whenever Yahweh calls you to do something in your own land, in your own ministry, in your own territory that is assigned unto you, you are going to have to sow some blood, sweat and tears. And if you do not sow some blood, sweat and tears, you are a false minister of the gospel. I'm going to tell you that right off the bat. Anybody that's going to sell you that it's easy, that's a piece of cake, that it's going to be all nice and dandelion, that you're going to be a millionaire from day one, and you're going to have all the money that you want immediately the moment that you say, Apchi, is lying to you. The gospel always requires blood, sweat, and tears. It has required that from the first century, and it's requiring exactly the same in the 21st century. And I'm going to tell you something, the people are ill-prepared for it. Ill-prepared for it. And so our mandate, that's my mandate, and now imparted unto each one of you, is emulate from the Jewish people that came to conquer Israel uh, to, from, from the elements of nature, not from the people. They didn't come here to fight people. The first Talias came here to simply conquer a land that nobody wanted. And you need to realize here, nobody wanted this land. Because the Turks had it for the purpose of money. They didn't care for it. They didn't build it up. They didn't plant it. They didn't make some amazing agriculture. They cut down trees so it becomes a desert. 
They never dried the swamps. For 400 years they had the opportunity. Now Islam had much more opportunity even before, not only during those 400 years. There were opportunities before, beloved ones, much before. There were opportunities for the Romans. There were opportunities for the Greeks. There were opportunities for the different empires. The British Empire that was here, even from the First World War to the uh, Second World War and after the Shoah, the Holocaust. We had many empires having the opportunity of making this land bloom and making it glorious, but they didn't. And they didn't because they didn't care for it. They wanted it for selfish reasons, false motivation, selfish ambition, but not because they cared for it. But when the Jewish people began to return to the land, they came to the land propelled by an inner force that was bigger than themselves. It was something from within that began to call them from the comforts of their own professions. Most of them were academics at the beginning and they came from Eastern Europe. From the comfort of their own professions, from the comfort of their own houses where they had some money, they had to come here, strip themselves naked, literally, of everything. And when you see pictures of them conquering the swamps, you will see them naked all the way to the torso, going into those swamps to go and to dry them. And when they came here, they didn't come from false ambitions, selfish motivations. They came from a more comfortable place to a more uncomfortable place. And I'm going to tell you something. When you are going to do something for Yah, you're always going to go from a more comfortable place to a more uncomfortable place. Nobody will tell me that the ministry is comfortable. In fact, there are statistics that say that of all the people that go into the ministry, only 10% survive the ministry. So if you're still in the ministry and you're, you're more than 20 years in it, more than 30 years in it, give yourself a good clap offering, I'll tell you. A good one. Anybody here more than 20 years in ministry? Right, lift up your hands. Lift, keep, keep it lifted. Anybody here more than, yeah, anybody here more than 30 years in ministry? Lift, lift up hands, lift up hands. Amen? Okay, one, two, three. Anybody? That's it, three. So what do we have? We have Andre, right? Andre from French Guyana. And we have Bishop Steve Maye from Suriname. And we have Archbishop Dominica Bierman from Israel and America and Chile. <laughs> Amen? And we've been more than 20 years, amen, in ministry, in, in vital ministry of Yah. I've been really more than 30 years in that ministry. And I want to tell you that the mere fact that we're only three here, that means that not many survive it all the way to the end. And those that are younger in ministry, if you've come very lately to become a minister, please take some example so that you understand that everything possible will and can be difficult when you're tilling your own land, when you're assigned to your own territory. But if you're willing to lay down your life, blood, sweat and tears, money and everything else in between, you're going to make it and you will be able to leave a legacy for the next generation to come after you. Are you with me what I'm telling you? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I, you, you hear what I'm saying? You see, Israel is our example. Now, not because Israel is perfect, because I can tell you 100 percent that we Israelis here are very imperfect people. And I'm going to tell you also that many of us are, are sinners, simple, normal, regular sinners, sometimes more than others even. We are. But I'm going to tell you something. Yahweh has placed something within the Jewish people that makes us to survive against all odds. And that something is called commitment. It's called tenacity. And sometimes we have the right devotion, sometimes the wrong devotion, but it's also devotion. Amen. Beloveds, I've written this book, The Identity Theft, because I believe that identity is everything. If we do not know who he is, what the original gospel is, and who we are, we are not going to succeed in this end of times to overpower the dictatorship and the tyranny of the powers and the principalities that are beginning to overtake the earth. It's becoming very dark out there. But this book will bring you light. Not only light, but equipping to become that powerful house of glory for the Most High God, for Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. And so I'm going to tell you that in anything that you're ever going to do for Yah, ever. And do you know when I'm saying anything you're ever going to do for Yah? And I know that I've got among us some people that are government figures. I know that I've got among us some people that are in business arena. 
I know that I've got some professionals among us and I'm not discounting you. Do you understand that in your arena you've been given a garden? If it is the government, if it's the army, I've got some army figures here. If it is the government, if it is the army, if it is the business arena, if it is the professional academical arena, you people, every one of you have been given a garden. Every one of us has been given a garden. In fact, that's the first thing that happened to Adam. Adam received a garden to till. And since then, Adam keeps on having a garden to till. Are you with me? Adam received a garden to till. Adam, say with me, Adam, Adam. was given a garden. And in the garden, there was a snake. But instead of taking authority over the snake, Adam, that means in woman form and in man form, Adam in woman and man form, listen to the snake. They should have rebuked it. Stopped it, paralyzed it, but instead of that, they listened to the snake. That is why man fell. Okay, so what I just told you is a mouthful, beloved ones, because that's the key for everything that you do in life. If I never preach to you one more message, and this is the last message you will hear from me, you already have everything you came for to Israel. And that is one message and one only. As long as you're going to keep your focus on Yahweh and He's calling for you to till your garden, whether it is in the ministry arena, whether it is in the business arena, whether it is in the professional arena, whether it is in the uh, government arena, in the military arena, I think I've touched most everything, in the motherhood fatherhood arena. We may have some mothers or fathers that are stay at home with their kids and Yahweh have showed you that is your garden that you need to till. Whatever it is the garden that you are assigned to till, remember in every garden there is a snake. Just like here in Israel when the Jewish people came back and they, they tried to conquer the land and they did through agriculture, there were many snakes there were many difficulties. There were many things that were speaking to them. Quit, quit, quit. God is not that good. Don't trust your inner uh, feeling that you have to come and restore yourself back to the promised land. Do not trust what the Bible says about the Bible promises. Like for example in Ezekiel 36, 24 to 28, where it says that he will bring us back from all the lands where he has exiled us and he will give us this land back here. And in this land, he will give us a new spirit. He will wash us with clean waters and he will give us a new heart and he will be our Elohim and we will be his people. By the way, I exactly am a prototype of the fulfillment of Ezekiel 36, 24 to 28. My father was the Zionist leader of Chile. He brought Chileans to make Aliyah from South America in 1970. And with us, we were four children, but there was a boatload of Chileans, academicals that came at the time. And here in this land, Yeshua revealed himself to me at the Sea of Galilee. And in this land, he washed me. With clean water, I got mikved, hallelujah. And in this land, I receive a new spirit, the Holy Spirit, the immersion by the Holy Spirit and fire. And in this land, and from this land, he wrote the Torah in my heart. And from this land, he sent me to more than 50 nations and hundreds of cities of the world to tell them of exactly the same God that I found here in this land that is still alive and exists He's the same one of yesterday, today, and forever, and he has nothing to do with religious systems. That's really the message. Amen? Amen. But I'm going to tell you something. When the Jewish people came to this land, they found the snake, and that snake was trying to tell them and discourage them. And you're going to find in every garden that you have been given, there's going to be a snake telling you, don't do this. Quit there. That's not where you should be. No, because God is not that good. What he promised, he's not going to keep. But once you begin to hear the discouragement in your mind and in your heart, you will remember my words that I told you that that's the snake that is mandatory that will be in your garden. Why is it mandatory that the snake will be in your garden? Do you know why? 
Do you know why it's mandatory that the snake will be in your garden? Anybody? Give me an idea. Why do you think that it's mandatory that the snake will be in your garden? Come on, come on. He will help you achieve your objectives. Why? He will help you achieve your objectives. Exact. That's interesting what Colonel Francis just said. What did he say? He said he will help you achieve your objective. Now, how can a snake help us to achieve our objective? Anybody, please. Go he ahead. Has to overcome what he's you will have to overcome what he's throwing at you. Did you all hear? You will have to overcome what he's throwing at you. And when you overcome what he's throwing at you, what is that going to make of you? An overcomer. <laughs> Very simple. An overcomer. That's exactly right. You see, people would like to have ministries without snakes. People would love to be in business, government, military, in their professional arena, in their homes, in their families, without any snakes. They would love not to have to encounter the snake. But I'm going to promise you from the beginning of mankind and until now, we are going to encounter the snake. And the best that we can know, instead of being in denial and like an ostrich putting our head in the ground and saying, well, you know, I bet, better I don't see it, I don't know, it's not there. No, no, better, the best we can do is to know it because it's a know your enemy. One of the best ways that Israel has succeeded in all the battles that we've had, and we're going to hear about some battles even as we go towards the Golan Heights. Your tour guides are going to tell you about some of the battles of Israel that we've had to fight. So many battles from inception, from the beginning. We didn't want to fight the enemy, but, the, but, but all the nations around, all the Arab nations, we were a thorn in the flesh in the midst of Islam. A thorn in the flesh in the midst of the Arab world. And therefore, from that moment on, they wanted to annihilate us and they began to come against us and they began to fight against us. Imagine that in 1973, and I was in Israel then, and I remember I was serving as a youngster. I was um, 16 years old and um, we didn't just go to school at the time when the war happened here, but actually I became a helper during the war. In my case, the men that had to deliver mail, they were in the front lines. So I would go around at my age, 16 years old, alone with a huge sack of mail and going from house to house, no email then, yeah, no email, no internet. I was going from house to house delivering mail from the soldiers in the front lines to the houses, to their families. That was a, a holy work to do because the families didn't have a cell phone to find out and text how the sun was. And so they were depending on that piece of mail to tell them if the sun was alive, if it was okay, what was happening with him. You see? And so 1973, the Yom HaKippurim War, can you imagine that the enemy, and the enemy, and I'm going to give him a name. That enemy is mentioned in the book of Revelation as the dragon with the seven heads, the red dragon. But that enemy principality is the principality of Amalek. And you're going to find the principality of Amalek in Exodus 17 that attacks Israel from the rear, attacks every time the weak places. We've been doing the anti-Amalek prayers during all these last almost two months. We've been declaring those anti-Amalek prayers because Amalek attacks from the rear, attacks the weak places, just like the snake in the Garden of Eden. And so in 1973, can you imagine that the enemy would come at the holiest day of the year, when we are fasting, when we are praying, and attack us at that time because the enemy knew that we were weak because we're fasting and we're praying at that time. Praise Yah, we won the war. Praise Yah that he, he intervened for us in this war, but it could have annihilated us. And the key factor for that war was the Golan Heights. Hallelujah, the Golan Heights, that was the place. If the Golan Heights would have been remained Assyrian territory, all this area of the Sea of Galilee that we're going to see very soon, the Kinneret, and even all the way to here would have been at the mercy of the Syrians. And the Syrians are the most cruel enemy. In fact, when you go to the Bible, the Syrians, I, I'm not saying they are all direct descendants, but some of them are, but the Syrians carry the spirit of the Assyrians. Hallelujah of the Assyrians of the 8th century that conquered all of the north of Israel and took the 10 tribes of the north 
to the exile in Assyria. And that was the biggest empire. They are also called the Arameans. And we are going to see the army of Aram or the army of Assyria, Ben Hadad, you've heard those names, connected with Elisha the prophet, for example, connected with Elijah the prophet, all of these names of Assyrian captains, Naaman, we're going to talk about that later on when we are in the Jordan River. And you're going to see that the same principalities are still sitting in the north at the border with the Golan Heights that want to again take all the north of Israel and cut it off the land of Israel and actually take the whole land of Israel. So we are dealing in the 21st century with exactly the same principalities. If it's the Philistine principality in Gaza, if it's the Assyrian, Aramean principalities that are over there in the north of the Golan Heights, beloved ones, when we do strategic intercession, we need to learn the history of what happened in the past. We need to learn our enemy and then do strategic intercession from that place and pray the word of promise over Israel because it's the most powerful weapon. In fact, the only real uh, offensive weapon that we have is actually the word, is the sword of the spirit. But we can't just pray our imaginations. We've got to pray the word of promise because that word of promise is an affront to the powers and the principalities of Assyria, the powers and the principalities of the Philistines. And so all of this world thing that has been formed, the Palestinian cause, or all of these conflicts in the Middle East is a spiritual conflict that is connected with the enemy, the devil that wants to set himself as the anti-Messiah and be worshipped as God. And whoever takes the land of Israel and whoever takes the Temple Mount, we will talk more about that in Jerusalem, then basically will rule the nations. And so when Israel began to come back and we found so many problems and so many issues and so many difficulties and so many enemies to overcome and understand that many people that came they even came from the sea right here, from the Haifa Bay. Why? Because during the time of the Shoah, the Nazi Holocaust, many of them, they tried to escape Europe in ships. And they arrived here as, as a wreck of people. They were, they were like skeletons coming out of the Shoah. And they arrived here and the British Empire was ruling. And many of them that arrived to the shores, they were turned back into Nazi Europe to die there. It's called illegal immigration. It was illegal because the British had only made a quota of Jews that could come in. Even though this is the land of the Jews, but yet they made a quota of Jews that could come in. And so if we pass the quota, then they were sent back to Europe. And so it was called illegal immigration. Many of the first Zionists, first people that built this land were those illegal immigrants. But they were not really illegal because this is the land of promise for the people of Israel for the Jewish people. So it was a lot of hardship to come into this land. Sanctify my heart. If you enjoyed today's program, we'd love to hear from you. Please send your comments, requests, or donations to kad-esh.org or mail to Kadesh Map Ministries, 52 Tuscan Way, Suite 202-412. St. Augustine, Florida, 32092, USA. Have a blessed week and join us again for the next Bible School on Wheels. Shalom.